are you? My name's Bond. James Bond. Bond. James Bond. Bond, what do you think you're doing? Keeping the British hand up, sir. Welcome to James Bond Radio. News, reviews, and discussion of all things 007. Pussy. As you can see, I have no problem with female authority. Oh, pipe down, 007. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Hello and welcome to James Bond Radio, episode number 0011. I'm Tom Sears and I've got my good buddy Chris Wright. Say hello, Chris. Hello, Chris. So we were a little bit mysterious this week on the old Facebook and Twitter, weren't we? In the in the sense that we were teasing everybody and saying that we had our very first celebrity guest. And uh, we can now reveal... It may have been a man. It may have been a woman. They may have been alive or dead. Exactly. We were throwing out some, some curveballs there to see if we could... Uh, we could tease you a little bit, but uh, obviously we're revealing today that we are talking to James Bond author Raymond Benson, which is pretty exciting. It's our first proper celebrity guest. Well, it, Bond author from 1997 to 2003, you know, great stuff. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a landmark occasion for us, this one. So before we uh, get stuck into our interview with Raymond, come and join us on Facebook, uh, which is James Bond Radio, if you type that into the search, or come and do our ultimate Bond quiz, 100 Questions of Bondage, which is available on jamesbondradio.com. And uh, also come and uh, leave us an iTunes review because that really helps us. Go onto our iTunes page and just give us a glowing five-star review saying we're the best thing you've ever heard in all your life. And that would be really, really handy to us. Also, if you want to appear on the show, we've got a little voicemail mechanism on James on radio.com where you can leave us a voicemail so if you've got any questions or anything you want to pose to us leave us a voicemail and we'll uh, we'll play it on the show and uh, and you can make an appearance on the show that's exciting isn't it chris i i think that that cool idea is somewhat under you so far so i really hope we get some good fans uh because we, we get a lot of people on on the facebook and the twitter as well obviously saying saying their their sort of ideas and their opinions but it'd be good to play one or two little voices Put, put yeah. some words to the names of our listeners. That would be great. Exactly. So, yeah, don't be shy. Come on. All you've got to do is click leave us a voicemail on jamesbondradio.com and, uh, and get involved. So I suppose before we, uh, we get chatting to old Raymond, we should, uh, we should do a little Bond 24 news roundup, shouldn't we? So there's been a lot there's of been a couple. there's been a lot of tidbits coming out lately, which is exciting. I always find the year in the lead up to a new Bond being shot is an exciting one because there's always little bits and pieces that just come out of the ether every now and then and, and get you excited. So I suppose the first one we should talk about is the old P- Penelope Cruz, I nearly called a pineapple cruise. The, the <laughs> pineapple <laughs> cruise, yeah. The, uh, the Penelope <laughs> Cruz rumors, um, which to me, as soon as I heard that, I thought, Alex, that's not real. Um, Obviously, she's married to Javier Bardem, so I guess that's probably where that came from. But uh, but what are your thoughts on the on the Penelope Cruz rumors? Well, I heard a few people sort of be quite happy about it because she's they were saying, oh, she's the same sort of age as Daniel Craig, him being a bit older now, and you know she's been in quite a few films and done quite well in some films. So personally, um, I've always liked the fact that Bond films, for the majority, have found people found sort of unknowns found people that not many others are aware of, especially within Hollywood, but yet are fantastic. Like we mentioned before, Mads Mikkelsen, um, like uh, so many Bond girls as well, um, Olga Kurilenko, um, people that have just come up and, you know, Bernice Marlowe, we hadn't heard of them, but yet they're brilliant. And sometimes if you get too too much of a familiar face, it might not quite work. That's exactly my thoughts on it. I think... Uh, just let's not have any celebrity big names in Bond. I just think it takes away from what it is. Um, Javier obviously is a slightly different animal uh, just because he was brilliant. But like, <laughs> I, I think, especially when it comes to the Bond girls, they're, they're, it adds like a level of expectation to it. You know what I mean? I remember like in the Brosnan years when it was almost like they were just leafing through the FHM's 100 sexiest women Top list. Top 100. Like, yeah, yeah. Let's choose that one for this one. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, yeah. come on, let's let's do something a bit yeah. better than that. And I, I think, you know, you look at Mads Mikkelsen, it's just amazing. You'd never seen the guy before, at least, you know, we hadn't outside of Denmark probably. Um, and it just adds an extra layer of, of coolness to discover these new people. I think get rid of the big names. Don't want them. Don't want them. No, especially with the Bond girls, definitely. Yeah. 
but uh, but yeah so there's that was that's rumor number one of penelope cruz which has since been disproven or denied so that's that's in the bag anyway uh the next one now i'm gonna i'm gonna just go out on a limb here i i'm i'm more than likely gonna end up doing a john travolta and getting this completely wrong but there <laughs> there is the rumor for the next bond villain is chiwetel Ejiofor. i think that was pretty good was that close That's pretty good I think it might have been. Wicked. Oh. I'm not sure. We'll have to ask him. Yeah. I think it was all right. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but yeah, he he kind of looks like he could do the job. What what do you think? I I don't know. I've never well, heard of him before until that news came no. out, and then I looked him up, and and he's been in a fair few things. Well, I watched uh, Twelve Years a Slave uh, a couple of months ago now. I think it was, and he was fantastic in that. Obviously, he won uh, the BAFTA for uh, best best male actor, and he was nominated for the Oscar um it's a fantastic film and he was he was amazing in it and he he's following in the line obviously we mentioned bardem uh oscar sort of nominated previously um we had matthew almerick who is an oscar oscar as well um so they they're heading down that sort of pathway and i think uh i i'd be i'd be excited to see him and also we haven't had a black villain since mr big since dr kananga that's that true back in 19 19- since 1973, it's been that long. Goodness gracious me, I hadn't thought about that. It's bloody high time we got one, eh? Exactly, Damn too right. right. And I, he'd be brilliant for it. So yeah, I mean, I'd be fully behind that. Well, I think scene. what gives this a little bit of, of, of credence as well is the fact that um, he's denied to talk. He's denied everything, hasn't he? He's, well, not denied everything. He's just refused to talk about it. To, he yeah. hasn't denied it. That's what I'm trying to say. He's yeah. just completely refused to talk about it, which, which you know, says everything. Which means he's under a contract to not mention mm. anything. So I don't know. I, I think he could be good. I think yeah. he could be good. Yeah, I think I think we've possibly seen our villain now. <gasps> Imagine. I know previ- when we talked about Bond 24, we had the idea of Blofeld coming back. Oh. A, a black Blofeld. Dude, I just got shivers down my spine when you said that. Imagine if it is. Because that would be a reimagining, wouldn't it? That would get you away from Dr. Evil big time. Completely. I mean, wow. Let's just just put that out there. You know, that could be that could be pretty impressive if that was the case. Very nice. I think that would be right up Fleming Street as well, isn't he? Because he he wasn't, let's say, very complimentary about uh, about the black people so you know it's no. it's uh you know it'll be it'll be up his alley that's for sure but yeah, yeah. Oh, oh man fingers crossed that comes off that's that's exciting yeah. i'm even more excited about it now you've come up with that that's yeah. good stuff <laughs> now the uh the other thing that's been in in the news this week is good old pierce my man um he's come out oh, to uh, probably to help publicize his new movie the love punch with old emma thompson yeah. um but he's come out and said i was never really good as james bond and he's basically sort of dissing his his tenure as Bond a little bit. Now, I've got a little article up here, um, and I'm just going to read basically what he said. Um, uh, da, 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 da. He professes himself unable to watch his old Bond films, finding them never good enough. I felt I was caught in a time warp between Roger and Sean. It was a very hard one to grasp the meaning, the meaning of for me. The violence was never real. The brute force of the man was never palpable. It was quite tame and the characterization didn't have a follow through of reality. It was all surface. But then that might have had to do with my own insecurities in playing him as well. So what do you think about that? Well, to me, I completely agree because he's not dissing himself. He's saying his films weren't up to standard. He's not saying he's a bad Bond because he wasn't a bad Bond. He was a brilliant Bond. And he's just reiterating what we've said before. Like that his, what he had to play with the material he was given was just not up to par compared to a lot of previous Bond films. Yeah, I so, agree with that. I, I think the, the difficult thing is as well, isn't it? It's like when something like Casino Royale comes along and just blows everything out of the water, and I mean everything out of the water, going yeah. right back to Connery, like it was that much of a stark difference and and so good. I can't wait till we get <laughs> so to that good. episode, man. It's going to take us a while, oh. but I cannot wait to get to that episode. It's going to be a five-hour <laughs> epic, good. I bet. Um, I think just so. me grunting into the microphone. <laughs> oh. um, anyway, um, the thing is, is immediately what comes before that kind of just gets washed away. And it's it's he's caught in that awkward point whereby something so good comes along immediately is going to get uh, compared to the, the guy who was previous. Um, 
And I don't think he was a bad one at all. I mean, I think looking back, there was like we've talked about before, and I think it was our second episode, or first episode, wasn't it, when we talked about all the bonds through? Um, yeah. Like he was given some really cheesy shit to say, and it's it's just you know nobody can make that sound good. If they dished that script up to Daniel, would he be able to do a better job? I don't know. It's just what Bond was at the time, and I think if you're going to cast Pierce in that light then you've got to do the same to Roger immediately. I mean, you just have to, because it's, it's it, that's, it is what it is. And at the same time, I see what he means about being caught between Roger and Sean, because I've heard a lot of people say that perhaps he wasn't his own bond and he was just a mishmash of those two. So I don't know, what. how do you feel about that? Well, no, I disagree with that as well, because he bought a totally different style to either of them. He had that real high-class sophistication, the suave factor, and he could pull off a bit of the Roger. He could pull off a little bit of the Sean. Okay, he wasn't one or the other. But that doesn't mean that he's just a mixture of the two because he did bring other stuff as well. Like the, that scene, the, the casino scene in a Golden Eye when he's um, sort of opposite on the top. And he, he bring, when he just walks in, you just see him walk into the casino and he's got that air about him. Mm. And it's not an air of menace, of pure confident menace like Connery. It's not an air of sort of almost sleazy charm like Roger. Yeah. It's an air of high-class sophistication and no other Bond has had that and probably will have that. So that is his Bond. That is a very good point. Yeah, I mean, like we've talked about with Connery, he's Connery's a little bit on the rapey side and 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 sort of aggressive in that, in that kind of sense. Roger is almost sort of like comedy camp, kind of over-the-top suave, kind of stuff whereas pierce is 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 not he's he's a slightly different animal on that front i think yeah you're absolutely yeah. right yeah um i think to be honest if i could choose a bond to be i would choose to either be connery or pierce that would be my choices I'd, i wouldn't be daniel i don't want to get my bollocks whipped whipped with a rope that's just goes <laughs> without don't. saying no i don't fancy oh. that it's not my cup of tea <laughs> um, you know roger i love him but you know i don't want to be roger same with timothy probably same with george a bit too heartbreaking at the end there Sean and Pierce all the way for me. That would be my yeah. bonds. And- I, I'm, I'm gonna. I'll bookend mine at the moment with Sean and Danny Boy. Yeah, I'll go for the hard nuts. <laughs> you do want the ball with the balls whipped. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh yeah, that's the only reason. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So uh, yeah, you, you you posted a little uh, photograph on the Facebook this week, which is very. Uh, that brings a, a, a heavy heartedness to its proceedings. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a bit of a shame. I saw it on actually it was on a another bond, uh, fellow Bond sort of fan brought it to my attention, and it was a, a double shot photo of a petrol station in Switzerland, and it was the same one that they used in Goldfinger, where Bond drove in with a DB5 with Tilly Masterson, and he parked up, and the big hill in the background, uh, and the mountains in the background, and yeah, there was a news report saying that that petrol station is going to be closed, uh, so it won't be. Evermore, which is a real shame because you see it. And although the petrol station itself is slightly different, you stand in the same position as the camera would have been, and you're like there, you're back yeah, in the film completely. And uh, it's, it's, it's a sh- it, when you hear sort of Bond locations disappearing or, or changing, it is a shame. So I love those ones, one, like, one. like with your Istanbul trip. I love the ones that look exactly the same as they were back in the day, like in the mosque and stuff. I mean, yeah. but the thing is, with that shot, you can see like the mountains are all there, just that whole setting is perfect except it's just obviously yeah. the layout of the garage has changed a little bit and like there's that little yeah. brick building that wasn't there and stuff like that. Um, but that's a shame that it's uh, it's going to close a little piece of Bond history there. Yeah, sad. So let's do a little bit of Bond trivia before we get into the interview. So like the I'm going to let you go first. Go for it. Okay, the Bond trivia. Well, seeing as today we are with obviously Raymond Benson, we're going to do a little bit of Bond trivia. Um, so my question is, uh, now, uh, Raymond Benton, he's obviously released quite a few uh, Bond books. He has released, there's been two occasions where he's released sort of anthologies. So there's been some of his Bond books released as an anthology. Uh, and I'd like to know that the names for each anthology are the Raymond Benton Bond novels. That's a good question. I think, I think I've got that. One of them, I'm not 100% if it had a different title and I'm thinking of the subtitle for it. But I think I've got okay. both of those. I've definitely got one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Good man. Good man. And uh, in the spirit of the books, I've got a Fleming-related question this week, which is, what is Ian Fleming's middle name? Ooh. And it's not Danger, as you might imagine. <laughs> oh, that's a shame. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. But yeah, 
Good question. Cool. Okay, so it's, it's Raymond Benson time. So uh, he's been uh, on the line to us talking all the way from Chicago. And uh, without further ado, let's have a little chat with Mr. Raymond Benson. Okay, so uh, we have our very first celebrity guest on James Bond Radio. We have Bond author extraordinaire, Mr. Raymond Benson. Hello and welcome to the show. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, thank you for having me. No worries, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So uh, thanks for joining us. We thought we'd uh, we always kick off our interviews with some uh, some quick fire Bond questions, just to give everybody an idea of you know where you're coming from as a Bond fan and, and what your your tastes are. So uh, so Chris, right now right now I'm coming from Chicago. Calling from okay. Chicago, excellent. We <laughs> we like we like interviews over the pond. It's good. So it's not too early there, is it, with you? No, it's ten o'clock. Okay, perfect. That's good. good so. Stuff. We're going to, yeah, so we'll set up this quick fire round, 007 questions. Uh, so you can take your time if you want, but if you can get an answer straight away, that's great as well. Okay, so question 001, what is your favourite Bond film, Raymond Benson? From Russia With Love. Okay, oh, answer. excellent response. That's Chris's favourite too, I think. Yeah, it's up there, definitely. Good stuff. Okay, question number two, what is your favourite Bond book? And you're not allowed to say one of your own. <laughs> From Russia with love. It's <laughs> <laughs> a pat for me here. That's good. I don't think you'll say the same for this answer, but we've got who is your favourite Bond girl? Guess. Could it possibly be someone <laughs> that's behind me, perhaps? I'm not sure. No, it'd be Tatiana Romanova. Oh, there we go. So nice. it is platform for me. And I think I I already know the answer to this one is who is your favourite Bond actor? <laughs> Good old Sean. Sir Sean. <laughs> okay, so if the answer to this is going to Tur Istanbul when you were younger, that's it. You know, we, we're cutting the interview there. But um, okay, so question 005 What is your earliest memory of Bond? Well, it was when I first saw, uh, saw Goldfinger on the big screen. I was Eight. nine years nine years old, wow. uh, and uh, my father took me to see it, and. Uh, yeah, that changed my life. <laughs> it's funny. That's uh, I remember hearing an interview with Pierce Brosnan, and he said exactly the same thing. His first yep. time we were seeing Goldfinger. The I think that's a lot of um, certainly people my age. That's uh, that was the seminal event because most of a lot of us kind of missed the first two in a way because they kind of were they snuck in, you know. But Goldfinger was such a big movie at the time; everybody knew about it, uh, and so. Uh, about six months later, you know, I saw it uh, winter of 64, 65. And then in the summer of 65, they released the double bill of Dr. No and From Russia With Love. So uh, within six months, I'd seen the first three films. That's pretty right. impressive. That's good. Do you remember, like, back in the day, whenever we see sort of pictures in magazines and stuff of of uh, film premieres and stuff when they were shown in the 60s, not just premieres, but the films themselves, you'd always see, like, streets full of uh, crowds waiting to go into the cinema, like hundreds of people. Was it was that the case back then? It was. Uh, for, for the big blockbuster movies, yeah, because, you know, back then you only had single standing theaters, you know, with one screen. You didn't have these multiplexes. And also movies did not open with a thousand prints uh, at the same time on the same day. They would open, you know, in the big cities first and then slowly move out to the to the rural areas. Um, so like for something like Goldfinger, especially like Thunderball, uh, that only opened in like New York and L.A. And uh, it was a roadshow attraction, which means that you had to have reserved seats to see it. Uh, and um, then, you know, about three months later into like six, 1966, you know, Thunderball opened for Christmas on Christmas Day of 65. And then it didn't really start going out to the rest of the United States until probably February or March of 66. And I don't think I saw it until the summer of 66. That's wow. right. So you, yeah. I, I don't know how you feel about this, Chris, but I've always felt envious of everybody who was around in those days to like see connery as bond for the first time you know for me obviously yeah. growing up it was always it was, like something that was on tv on a sunday and you'd always see it around but yeah. the first time it's been a, a magic it was time. astounding it, it was quite uh i mean 
they they were the the Bonds were the Star Wars of the '60s. You know, they were they were they were the blockbuster action films. You know, there was nothing else. Man. There were a lot of imitations that came later. You know, in the late '60s, uh, like the Flint movies and the Matt Helm movies and stuff like that. But nothing compared to Bonds. And mm. you know, and people did stand in line around the block for those movies. I remember my I was speaking to my dad recently, and he was saying that he went to. Uh, see Thunderball um, back in the day and it, um, outside the cinema screen they had the BSA lightning motorcycle uh, that Fiona Vol Volpe drove in the film and he remembers going and like everyone passed as they went in and, and he said it was well you know he was hooked from that as well it's, sure it's, uh, yeah it's, it must have been quite a special occasion I think it was. it was and then you know I I started reading the books uh, immediately after I saw Goldfinger I was only nine but I started reading the Fleming books, even though probably they were a little bit over my head at the time. But I, 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 I managed to at least get the story, you know, and read. You know. Then I reread them a little later when I was a little older. And, but, yeah, I was I was hooked and I was a Bond fan from 65 on. Cool. So uh, quick fire question number 006. Is there a Bond location that you'd love to visit? Wow. Um, you know, I've, I have visited most of them. Uh, well, Switzerland, I guess. I've never been to uh, the Honor Majesty Secret Service locations. I'd love uh, to go to the. Yeah. I'd love to go to the to the, you know, to the. Peace Gloria. Yeah, Peace Gloria. Mm -hmm. That would be good. Cool. Funnily enough, the last interview we had, that was their answer as well, Aaron Cooley, and that's my answer as well. So everyone is going to have to head there at some point together, I think. Yeah. Be when good. I was when I was researching uh, the man with the red tattoo, I saw a lot of the you only live twice. Uh, locations in oh. japan so uh that was that was one off the bucket list did you um, see the volcano there is no volcano oh, no. <laughs> <was> all fake. <laughs> yeah uh, yeah that was uh i mean there probably was a mountain you yeah. know and yeah. they kind of made it look like a volcano <laughs> so yeah okay and uh quick fire Last one, 007 question. And um, what is the most Bondian thing you have ever done? Tricky one. <laughs> wow. Um, hmm. Well, I've never jumped out of an airplane without a parachute. Uh, <laughs> hmm. Well, you know, a lot of the things I did while I was researching the books, you know, I would travel to those countries and stuff. Uh, when I went to Cyprus for the facts of death, you know how Cyprus is uh, divided into uh, a Turkish side and a Greek side? Yeah. And uh, in 1974, there was a war between them and the UN had to stop it. Well, that's a divided country right now. And there's like a no man's land in between. And uh, you have to like, if you're gonna cross from one side to the other, it's like crossing you know, Checkpoint Charlie back when the Berlin Wall was up. And uh, I, you know, the, the Greek side, they check your passport and everything, and then they send you on your way. And you're walking through this sort of deserted, bombed out road with nobody else there except all the overturned cars and things like that that have been left the exact same way they were in 1974. Wow. And then you reach the other side and the Turkish people are there and they check your passport and everything and, and let you in. So it was a little weird, you know, with all the guards and stuff like that. But, you know, eh, I, I, I try to avoid dangerous situations. <laughs> That's clever and I'm man. married, so I can't sleep with any woman that uh, comes my way. So, <laughs> <laughs> When you were walking from one checkpoint to the other, did you happen to come across a bald guy with lots of diamonds in his face? At all? No, no, no. Shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think the less said about that, the better, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was in Korea, though. You know, yeah, it was, it was, it was. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> cool. So I suppose uh, it all started for you and Bond with uh, James Bond bedside companions. So I remember when I was a kid, my brother was always the Bond fan in the house, and he kind of introduced it to me. And I remember seeing this book on the shelf when I was a kid. And it always used to scare me because it had the massive spider on the front cover. So I never really liked to look at it. But uh, but yeah, could you just talk a little bit about kind of how that came about? What what inspired you to write it and, and what brought that all up? Sure. Well, as I said, I was a you know a huge Bond fan growing up, but I kind of became a normal person and went to college. And uh, actually, I, I uh, studied theater 
and I, uh, after I graduated with a, a degree, I, I moved to New York City and was working in the theater off off Broadway, off Broadway, way off Broadway, uh, <laughs> directing plays and composing music and stuff. And, you know, the joke I, I tell is there was no money in theater, so I became a writer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know actually one night some friends of mine and I were sitting around the table and the question came up what book would you write if you had to write a book and we all went around and when it came to me I said you know I think I'd write a like an encyclopedia kind of book about the history of James Bond and everybody kind of went ooh you know a lot about James Bond you should do that and at the time this was in the very early 80s the only books about James Bond that were out was Steve Rubin's The James Bond Films and uh, uh, the James Bond in the cinema by uh, John Brosnan and uh, the James Bond dossier by Kingsley Amos, which was out of print and uh, the uh, Ian Fleming biography by John Pearson, which was out of print. So I wanted a book that had all everything, you know, I wanted the history. I wanted a biography of Fleming. I wanted the analyses of all the books and the movies because there wasn't anything like that. Now there's lots of books like that. You know, there's tons of books like that. But yeah. then in, the, in 1982, 81, 82, there was not. So I pitched it to a publisher and they said, sure, that sounds great. <laughs> so I got a contract. As easy, as, easy so as, as that. <laughs> as easy as that. Uh, it took three years to do. I went wow. to England and uh, did a lot of research. I met members of Ian Fleming's family and his business people. And we got along really well. And, uh, they liked the book when it came out. And so we uh, we stayed in touch, and uh, you, you also did an updated version, didn't you? Sort of later in the in the eighties, did you? Do yes, the first version? version was only published in America. That was nineteen eighty four. Okay. And the one the one he mentioned uh, with the spider that was the nineteen eighty eight version. That was the first time it was published in the UK. So it was an updated version. It yeah. the first one only went through uh, Never Say Never Again. And then the second one went through uh, the Living Daylights. So you decided to include Never Say Never Again then? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, it's still a Bond movie. Yeah, they're, of course. They're both Bond movies, no matter what you say, you know. <laughs> That's true. Uh, so um, obviously with that, that was kind of like um, a, a non-fiction as it were. Um, yeah. And so when, how did you find this sort of uh, transferring to writing fiction um did you was it did you find that sort of an easy process or a, a difficult one or it was a um uh, it it was easy um right after the bedside companion i got involved in the computer gaming business because that was just getting off the ground in the mid 80s that's when pcs were coming into the home and computer games were just starting to be made uh, in the very early days, there were just what we called text adventures, you know, like, I don't know if you've ever heard of Zork or uh, the Infocom games that they were, it was all text yeah. where, you know, it would describe uh, a situation like it says, you are in a forest, there's a sword <laughs> in the ground, a path leads to the right and a path leads to the left. What do you do? And you type, pick up the sword. <laughs> you are holding a sword. Now what do you do? Go right. You emerge upon a meadow, you know, and it tells a story as you solve these puzzles as you go along. Those were the first computer games. Wow. And I was hired uh, by my, my agent at the time, knew I was into games. Uh, I liked, uh, you know, I played the James Bond role-playing game and I actually written an adventure for one of those. Um, and they said, would you be interested in doing these text adventure computer games? Because it's basically writing writing a novel times three you know because it's it's the story plus all the different paths you can take you know all the alternatives so i said sure it sounds great so that's what i i started that's where my fiction writing really started but it was you know interactive fiction so um it it was very much the same as creating a novel in that you had to have characters and a plot and obstacles and and that kind of thing except that you also had alternatives for people who made choices um, so I, I, Rick, you were involved in some of those Bond computer games in the eighties, weren't you? So were they all like the text-based adventures, or were they the two I did? The two I did were that was uh, View to a Kill and Goldfinger. Uh, they were text adventures. So yeah, I did those, and I uh, did a Stephen King adaptation. And then a little later, um, 
I got involved in, you know, when computer games got more and more elaborate with graphics and role playing, then they became like little guys that were walking around and you controlled the little guy. Uh, and so, yeah, I did that for about 10 years. And then in late 1995, I got a call out of the blue from uh, Peter Jansen Smith, who was uh, Ian Fleming's literary agent. He was the chairman of Glidros at the time. Glidros was the company that you know, publishes the Bond books. He told me that John Gardner uh, wanted to retire from the role. He'd been doing it for 15 years and uh, they wanted to know if I wanted to give it a shot. must have uh, felt quite interesting. How do you remember the, do you remember that day that you yeah, were told? Oh yeah. and, and how did you feel, obviously? Well, I, I think I fell on the floor. <laughs> I, uh, I said, you know, how could I, how could I refuse? You know, yeah. I, I had to say, sure. Yeah, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. Um, and what I had to do was come up with a storyline, basically a plot, an outline, if you will, uh, of what I think a next Bond novel would be. And that would be on spec. So I did that and it had to be approved by not only Glidros, but the British publisher and the American publisher. And once that was approved, I, they wanted me to write the first four chapters on spec. And so I did that and had to go, went through the same approval process and then they gave me the contract and suddenly I was a novelist. This is incredible. Firstly, you walked into a publishing company and say, I've got an idea for a James Bond bedside companion book and they say, sure, have some money, go and write it. And then you just get a call out of the blue from, from well, the precursor to Ian Fleming publications saying, do you want to write the next Bond book? This is incredible. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it was handed to me on a silver platter, and, and it's, it's certainly a unique uh, story in the annals of public publishing, you know. Uh, and Zero Minus Ten was my first novel published. That's crazy. Uh, I'd ac actually, I'd written a novel before, but, you know, it's the, that first novel that you always hide in a drawer and never take out again. <laughs> um, but Zero Minus Ten was my first novel published. So, you know, it was it was filling big shoes and a little scary because huh. I knew, you know, the entire world would look at it under a microscope. Yeah. Uh, so I basically learned on the job how to write a novel. So that's pretty incredible. It's like, how was it coming into something like that, which has got such a history? Like, how did you choose? I mean, did you read all the John Garden books before and then pick oh, yeah. and choose the continuity that you're going to keep and what you're going to discard? Like, how did you approach that? Side of yeah, well, you know, I, I'm, I was a big Bond fan, so I, I'd kept up with everything. I'd read all the books, all the John Gardner. I knew John Gardner. He was a friend of mine. I oh, wow. interviewed him and uh, uh, done all, you know, I was, I'd been writing articles for the various fan magazines like Bondage in, the America, in America and 007 in the UK. Yeah. So, you know, and I'd, I'd be going to some of those conventions that they would have in the 80s uh, where I was, you know, they kind of considered me like a Bond expert, whatever that is, yeah. uh, because of the bedside companion and things like that. So I had that going for it. Um, with zero minus 10, um, they, they, we, had a, we had to sit down and said, what direction should we go in? And at first, we kind of bandied about the idea of keeping Bond in the 50s and 60s. And, you know, John Gardner had updated him to the 80s and not in early 90s. Yeah. And uh, we kind of talked about, you know, let's put Bond back in the 50s or 60s. And then they said, you know, because GoldenEye was such a huge hit, they said, why don't we you know, continue keeping him in the 90s? and try to make the books a little bit more like the Brosnan movies, you know, with a lot more action and more complex plots. And, and I said, well, I, that's fine with me, but you know, I really want to keep the character of Bond like Fleming's Bond. I want him to be, a, you know, more cold and ruthless and, um, you know, have, I still want him to smoke and drink and, you know, be a womanizer. I don't want any of this political correctness. Yeah. <laughs> Good. And they said, "Well, we agree. Uh, if you can, if you can do that, great. You know, let's see how you do." Yeah. So, you know, kind of putting a 1950s Bond in a 1990s situation makes him a little anachronistic, but I think that also made him stand out. 
so I think it worked, you know, and I did give him a little humor. I mean, I gave him some, some of the quips that we expect from the, from, you know, if, if people picked up a Bond book and they'd never read Fleming or John Gardner, that was kind of the idea. They'd seen the Brosnan movies or whatever, the, all the movies, and then they pick up one of my books, they would expect it to kind of be the same. Yeah. So that was the idea behind my six novels was let's make it like the Pierce Brosnan books, but let's have Fleming's Bond in them. It's a good, good sort of formula that I think, isn't it? Yeah, I, I guess there's certain things that you can and can't do, isn't there? Like, for example, some of the things you can't really carry over is like the racism in the in Fleming books. You right. I didn't you do can't, that. Yeah, <laughs> you can't do the uh, you can't do that. You can't be too sexist like Fleming's Bond was. So you, I suppose you've you got to have elements of some of those things in there but you can't right. go too far to match the times that's right yeah and um prior to um zero minus ten you also wrote a short story uh, blast from the past um so how did that come about when you what 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 was the sort of um, thing that made you uh, come up with the idea to write that short story well that was the first thing we did um you know playboy magazine especially here in the united states is a pretty big deal mm -hmm. um and they were the first magazine to publish Ian Fleming in America, uh, starting with the 1960 issue. Uh, and they, you know, Playboy and James Bond were kind of in bed together <laughs> a long time because they would publish Fleming's short stories as well as excerpts from his novels in the early 60s. And then they would continue to have uh, pictorials from the movies and things like that. So I had said, I knew Hugh Hefner was a Bond fan. So when the Bedside Companion was published, I sent him a copy. And he wrote me back and said, wow, this is really great. Thank you very much and blah, blah, blah. And we started a little correspondence, you know, talking about Bond. Then when I got the, uh, actually he, when I was in LA, he invited me to the Playboy Mansion. That's I what was, I was I going was to at, ask. <laughs> yeah, this was, this was before I was the Bond author. This was in the early, this was in 1994, I believe. And I was there for, um, a Bond convention that was in L.A. Uh, that George Lazenby uh, attended. I did a big speech and everything. But uh, Hefner invited me over to, to the mansion for movie night. And, uh, you know, kind of we became chummy. Then when I got the Bond gig, I suggested to Glidrose, I said, you know, I kind of know Hugh Hefner. Why don't we make a pitch to him and do a, an exclusive new short story for Playboy magazine? And Kick, kick off my tenure as the Bond author. And they thought that was a great idea. So I wrote to Hef and I said, hey, guess what I'm doing? <laughs> and so he was excited and uh, we decided to write, you know, we did Blast from the Past first. So that was really the first thing I wrote. And then- And dare we, ask, um, dare we ask what movie you were watching uh, for movie night at the Playboy Mansion? That night, you mean the first time I went? Yeah. Uh, it was The River Wild with Meryl Streep. Wow, very good. And I like John the idea. C. Riley. Oh, John C. Riley's class. Yeah, I like the idea of having a movie night at the Playboy Mansion. This, you know, they do that. They do that every Sunday. It's uh, every Sunday night. They show a current movie at the mansion, and Hef invites about fifty of his friends, and uh, they have a buffet dinner, and they watch a movie. That's I haven't, how. I haven't had my invite yet, so um, yeah, I'm, well, I'm, I'm waiting for it in the post. <laughs> I was going to say sometimes on Fridays, Fridays and Saturdays, sometimes they have classic movies, you know, old movies. Okay. But, yeah, but Sunday's always a new movie. Okay. <laughs> I, I think we should send Hugh a, uh, a couple of episodes of James Bond Radio on CD and uh, <laughs> <laughs> see if we can get an invite. <laughs> well, his friends call him Hef. <laughs> okay, so so if we address him as Hef, you know, he might think. We're on good terms. So. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so did you did you have any, when you first came in to, to writing the books, whoopsie daisy, I've just pulled my headphones out, that's totally unprofessional. Um, the uh, Did you have any kind of misgivings about coming in as an American? Because Fleming and Bond are kind of like the as much, most quintessential English as you can possibly get. Did you have any kind of worries about that side of things? Well, you know, um, Glidrose, the people at Glidrose uh, had said, you know, uh, we'll make sure, you know, no Americanisms, you know, kind of creep in, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be vetting for that as well as the British publisher, the editor there. Uh, it was going to be, you know, uh, it was going to happen, you know, but they wanted me to try to write or to, to try to write English, you know, try to write British. 
you know, substituting lift for elevator and all that stuff. Yeah. So I did my best. And uh, I think for the first couple of books, you know, they had to, you know, change a few things, but I, I got into it better. You know, as the books went on, they hardly had to change anything. So I kind of, I kind of got, I, I was anglicized by, <laughs> <laughs> by writing Bond books. Um, I didn't worry about it. Uh, although, you know, um, some of the British fans immediately jumped on, on it and, uh, attacked me, I think just because I was an American. Uh, I mean, I, I still had plenty of British readers who liked my books, but there was, there was a contingent, I think that, uh, just didn't want to even entertain the notion of, of an American James Bond, just like, uh, there was that group that didn't want to entertain a blonde James Bond when Daniel <laughs> Craig was, uh, was, uh, cast. And he's doing okay now, so. Yeah, exactly. Um. So, you know, any author is going to be uh, subjected to criticism and stuff. But, you know, J with James Bond, you know, it's kind of a it comes with a lot of baggage and everybody yeah. has their own uh, idea of what James Bond should be. Uh, you know, there's people that uh, are strictly Fleming purists. There's people that, you know, are fine with accepting, you know, the Gardner Bonds and my bonds or the you know, Roger Moore versus Sean Connery, which were two very, very different interpretations of James Bond. Uh, you know, Timothy Dalton versus Roger Moore, mm. et cetera, you know. Um, yeah. So everybody kind of has their own image of what Bond is. Um, yeah. That came, came with the territory. <laughs> I guess something like Bond, especially like you can't please all the people all the time. There's always going to be that crowd who kind of have a bad reaction to, it, to anything. Right. But I, I suppose like when you're when you're writing these books, like you mentioned a little bit earlier on about you, you got to do a fair bit of travel to, to research the books and stuff. So kind of how, how did that play out? Like where whereabouts did you go? What was the, the process of kind of research, researching each book like? Well, I would start off each book with an outline because that was required by Clidrose. They wanted to see the outline of the story that I wanted to write and they would approve it. And I never had an outline rejected. So, um, so I would, the, the hardest part is coming up with the plot, with the villain and the plot, uh, because the character, you know, Bond is already given to you. So uh, you got to come up with a, uh, a villain that's kind of unique, a plot that hasn't been done yet, uh, not only in the books, but the, the movies too. Um, so I would kind of look at the map of the world and find hot spots that Britain would be concerned about. Uh, so that's why the first book was in Hong Kong, because I knew it would be published in 1997, which was the year that uh, Hong Kong was handed back to China. And uh, I, that was all in the news and everything. And I was going, well, hmm, why is it being handed back in the first place? And why did they own it in the first place? You know, so I did a little research and you know, uh, discovered that there was this war between Britain and China in the 1800s over opium and Britain won the war. And in the treaty, they were given the territory known as Hong Kong, but some fool in England, in London wrote into the treaty, we'll give it back to you in a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why it happened. So, you know, Britain, uh, honored that commitment. And in 1997 was giving it back to China. The, the problem was that, you know, six million people that lived in Hong Kong had been living under a democracy and then they were going to be handed to a communist country. You know, how, how many people, you know, I bet there were some people were a little concerned about that. Yeah. And I also thought, well, maybe some British business people who had their businesses in Hong Kong might be concerned. And that's how my villain came about. Uh, I thought, okay, the villain would be an Englishman with a very big Hong Kong business that he would lose uh so he tries to stop the handover so that's kind of how each each book kind of started that way uh then i would write the outline and then i would travel i would go to the country in question and kind of walk in bond's footsteps according to the outline and uh, maybe change some things if i had to if once i see a place um you know i'd i'd stay in the hotels and eat the food and all that kind of stuff so i could describe it in the books that's incredible. That's yeah. that's got to be one of the best jobs you could possibly have. <laughs> I was just thinking the same thing. Yeah. Then I would come back and then uh, write the book, 
uh, then it would go through, uh, you know, revisions. It would go, uh, first Glidrose would have things to say about it. Then the British publisher would have things to say about it. Then the American publisher would have things to say about it. So I was edited three ways, wow. uh, which is unusual. Uh, and then I'd turn it in and I'd start on the next one. That's great. That sounds so good. And speaking of like traveling, um, we, we read recently there's a, a museum in Japan which has been set up solely dedicated to the man with the red tattoo. Now, uh, have you visited the museum? You know, when did they, did you, you obviously need to give approval to it and, and what, what's your sort of awareness of it all? Well, I didn't have to approve it. Um, uh, they had to get permission from the Fleming estate to do it. Um, See, so, you know, it, it's on this island called Naoshima, which is a location in The Man with the Red Tattoo. When I went there uh, to research, uh, they were just, you know, the government was very pleased and proud to be in a bond book. And so after it was published, they, they wanted to erect this sort of touristy bond museum on the island. And uh, so they did, and it opened in 2005, and they flew me and my wife there to, for the ribbon cutting ceremony. <laughs> Uh, and it uh, basically, as you walk through it, uh, it's filled with uh, art, you know, sculptures and paintings and things like that that students and other artists have done that illustrate the story of the book. So as you walk through the, the museum, you get the story of the novel. And then there's a, you know, and there's a case of, uh, you know, stuff of my research stuff that I donated and things about me. And then there's, you know, movie stuff, you know, posters and things like that. So it's it's. It's not just a man with a red tattoo museum. It is a James Bond museum in general. So be worth a visit then, I think, one day. Tom, what do you think? Definitely. We've got to add it to the list. We've, we've got yeah. a massive list of locations we want to go to. So that's the Well, it's, a, it's a very cool island because, uh, you know, Vanessa House, which was where I set uh, the story of the novel, this museum where the G8 summit is taking place and all the mosquito, the deadly mosquitoes are unleashed. And the big heart sculpture that the little kappa comes out of that place exists on the island and it's fantastic it's just it looks like a ken adam set no way that's, when i that's saw pictures crazy. of it when i was doing research early research i saw pictures of it and i said oh wow that looks like a bond set i'm going to use that yeah so that's how it happened. That's great. that's great that's almost like being part of the bomb production and doing your own location scouting but for the book rather than to film. That's, that's great. That's exactly the way it works. Yeah. So kind of now a bit of time has passed. It was two, your last book was 2003 or four was it? I can't remember. Which one? I'm sorry. You, your last book, the last one. 2002. 2002. 2002. Okay. So you've had a bit of time since, uh, since your tenure finished. Like when you look back on that period, like, you know, what's, what's your favorite of your Bond books? What's possibly your least favorite? Is there anything you'd have changed about what, what ended up in the books, anything like that? Well, I don't think there's anything I would have changed. Uh, and, you know, saying what my favorite is, is like picking your favorite child. <laughs> and Just don't I, tell I'm, the others. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm partial to High Time to Kill. High Time to Kill, I think, is probably the most unique of all of them. Uh, I really wish, you know, the, the film people might look at that one because, uh, you know, it takes place in the Himalayas. We haven't had a mountain climbing Bond film. No, that's a good point. And uh, so I think that one is my favorite. Uh, well, that, the entire Union trilogy, that mm. Double Shot and Never Dream of Dying, those three books, I think, are, are pretty strong. I have friends that, you know, really love Zero Minus Ten. I don't know. Uh, it's I don't know what my least favorite is. Yeah. <laughs> They're all good. They're all good. Um, there's an in, there's an interesting thing that you mentioned earlier. You know, obviously, when you wrote the sort of text games, it, it, you know, um, whoever was playing the game could either choose this or choose that. And I remember back when, uh, in the must have been the late '80s, there were a band of novels called Choose Your Own Adventure novels, yes. where you'd be in a situation. And it would be, do you open that door or go through that door? It's the same same sort of setup. But I've never seen a Bond novel with that idea. And do you think that's something that could work? Or do you think that, that well, they could did, be a they mix? Well, they did Bond Choose Your Own Adventures back oh, in the They 80s. did, did they? Oh, yes, I they did. There's several of them. I bet if you Google them, uh, you could find pictures of them. They were all sort of based on the Roger Moore. Okay, yeah. 
that's that's something um, my childhood missed out on. <laughs> yeah. They they but they were for kids, you know. They were for yeah. they weren't for adults. They were for um, kids. So I don't know if an adult novel would work that would work well no. that way. Best best to keep it sort of with the formula as it is, I suppose. So um yeah, so you mentioned obviously the last one was in two thousand and two. So what's what's kind of next for Raymond Benson? Do you have anything on the cards, or are you just enjoying love? life at the moment going here well, there, and I, I continue to write my own stuff I've been writing since then you know I've uh, I, I do my own original novels as well as you know the the kind of tie-in uh, novelizations based on video games and such that I get hired to do which is good bread and butter work my latest series is the black stiletto have you heard of that yeah we yeah I haven't read it I've heard of the black stiletto yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's a five book saga and four of the books have been published, and the fifth one and final one comes out in November. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of been my magnus opus for uh, magnum opus for the last four or five years. Did you have trouble sort of transferring your uh, your anglicized knowledge from writing the bonds in did, into these books now? Did they have to revert back to the U.S. sort of language? Or <laughs> pretty much, I just kind of turned off the anglicization and. Uh, I'm back to back to being American. So. Yeah, it's a good skill to have. <laughs> so to finish up, we always like to ask what we would deem the ultimate question when it comes to Bond. Um, if you had an unlimited budget and you could choose any director, any actor, any team at all to produce your dream Bond film, who would you have? Whoa. <laughs> well, it would be High Time to Kill. <laughs> good, good choice. Right there. If it was high time to kill, I'd be happy. Um, wow. Um, uh, that that requires a little more thinking. Yeah. Um, I might cast uh, Michael Fassbender if it was today. Oh, oh good, good man. Show. We've we've had. He's currently my favorite if, if uh, when Daniel leaves if he takes over I'll be happy. Yeah, I think he's he's mine he's my next bond anyway yeah, definitely. Uh, and as far as a director I don't know um, uh, Christopher Nolan maybe he's 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 desperately wants to do one uh, well I met him I met him and uh, we talked about the scene in inception Oh, so good. He was very much like Honor Majesty Secret Service. And I, I asked him right out. I said, come on, was this an homage to Honor Majesty Secret Service? He said, yeah. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that would make for an interesting film, I think, with Christopher Nolan and Michael Fassbender. On 26, maybe. Who knows? Well, you know, Eon has not shown any interest in doing any of the continuation novels, whether it's mine or John Gardner's or Kingsley Amos or Sebastian Folks or. Do you know why that is? Because what, 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 I, I remember thinking about that years ago. Like, there's some there's some great material in in all of the continuations. Really, what, what are your thoughts on why they're perhaps not interested? They want to have control. They want to create their own stories. I think, and also, you know, it may be a financial thing. They just don't want to pay a second. You know, they have to pay Glidrose a fee. To make a Bond movie, yeah. then they, if they had to do, you know, one of ours, they'd have to pay a, an extra fee. So yeah. I don't know. I really don't. I'm just suspecting. That's speculation. So I've never been told why. Uh, it's just kind of the way it is. So you mentioned before that you know, being a huge Bond fan, you read all the John Gardner books and stuff. Do you still keep up with the other continuation authors whenever sure. a new book comes out? Sure. I do. Any favorites? Jeff, Jeffrey, De Jeffrey Deaver is a good friend of mine, and uh, you know he's the second American to be uh, to be the Bond author. So we've been doing actually a lot of we get asked to do dual speeches, you know, dual talks and stuff. You know, uh, we just put out I don't know if you're aware of this. Uh, he and I this is the first collaboration between two former Bond authors. Oh wow! It's a it's a book of short stories. Um, we co-edited it and contributed stories to it that's their stories all about the cold war oh. and we asked uh, we invited other authors to submit stories and uh it's under the uh umbrella of mystery writers of america the book is called ice cold tales from an it, tales of intrigue from the cold war edited by jeffrey deaver and raymond benson and it's and out we'll, now it's out uh, now okay. yeah yeah it's probably published in the uk too right have to keep a lookout for that one then 
All right, well, thank you very much for joining us today. It's given us a, an insight on what it's like to be a Bond writer. It's certainly a job I can't write at all, but it'd certainly be a job I'd be interested in. If, they, if they're listening and they want to give me a call out the blue and offer me yeah. you know, a job writing the book, I'm up for it. It, it obviously happens, you know, and if you get to travel here, there and everywhere, sample things, you know, why not? Why not? It'd be good. But it's been great to meet you, Raymond. Thank you for having me on. No worries. Where can, uh, where can our listeners find you online? What, what's your Facebook? What's your website and all that kind of stuff? Well, I'm easy to find on Facebook. I have a personal page and a, an author page. And the Black Stiletto also has a page. Uh, I'm sure if you just type my name into the search box, you'll find both of them. Um, my website is RaymondBenson.com. My Twitter is at Raymond Benson. There you go. Oh, that's beautiful <laughs> stuff. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we'll uh, we'll get stuck into your uh, Cold War stories book. That sounds great. And, uh, okay. Thanks. See you again soon. And good okay, luck with the rest of the Black Stiletto. Thank you. Okay. So, how cool was that? Our first ever Bond celebrity on the show. Did you enjoy the interview? Yeah, I really did. It was it was good because obviously we've been doing a bit of research. We learned quite a lot about him beforehand. But there were a couple of little snippets that he brought up. There, mm. obviously, I mean, the Playboy Mansion. You know, that's that's uh, got to be an interesting evening that he spent there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy, isn't it? Like th- these things that have happened to to Raymond, like just getting a phone call out of the blue to write the new books. I mean, is that not the ultimate phone call for any fiction writer? Like at least any kind of thriller writer. I mean just to get that handed to you on a plate without even pursuing it is incredible and then just sending a copy of your book to, to hugh hefner at the playboy mansion yep. getting a letter back having a bit of correspondence why don't you come and join us and you know come over to the, <laughs> to the playboy mansion and hang out for a bit i mean that's insane why does stuff never like that have never happened to me like that uh, no. well i think it might do if we you know put your mind to it or something maybe but also i mean the job that he has where he mentions you know when he's researching a, a, a novel he, he goes away to the countries, he goes to the hotels, he eats the food there, experiences the culture, you know, he's almost location scouting for places he can use in his novel. I mean, what a job. I, mean, I know, it, so doesn't, much, it doesn't. So good. Aside from perhaps writing the Bond movies or being Bond in the movies, I don't think there's probably a better job, is there really? No, I mean, no, right up there. Maybe, maybe we should put ourselves forward. We can be the first duo Bond writers. You've, you've got some writing <laughs> skills only about. I'll just sit there barking ideas at you, and you can, <laughs> you can write them down. <laughs> yeah, let's see what we can do. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, yeah, let's let's run through our. I suppose we should call them Benson facts, shouldn't we? This time around. Yeah, they are. So I'm going to do my Benson little jingle. Facts indeed. Dun, dun, dun. It's time for Benson facts, and there it is. It. You kick it off this time, dude. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to go. We've got a few uh, Benson facts each. The first one I've got here, Raymond Benson has written a total of six Bond novels, three Bond short stories, and three Bond novelizations of the films. And those films were Tomorrow Never Dies, The World Is Not Enough, and Die Another Day. Very nice. It's quite an impressive body Uh, of work, really. It's quite nice. Yeah, it's good. And it's a good mix as well, which I thought was quite good. Um, he was. I think we might have mentioned this earlier, but he was the official Bond author from 97 to 2003. So if you wanted to write Bond during that time, if your name wasn't Raymond Benson, you ain't getting any of it. Yeah. Um, and finally, he uh, he continues to write a series of classic film reviews for the publication Cinema Retro. Very nice. Which is a really good publication indeed. My set of Bond facts are in 1986, Benson wrote a pen and paper Dungeons and Dragons style role playing game called You Only Live Twice 2. <laughs> which i thought what a i know it's quite a funny choice that one but I, I i have seen that about actually i think it was there was like an old out of print edition on amazon a while back so it'll be interesting to pick that up and just kind of see yeah maybe we should play it man maybe we should do a special episode where we play through the role-playing game and uh and okay it. Um, <laughs> somewhat uh somewhat differently he's also a keen piano player and regularly performs around his native chicago and you can even hire him for your private functions how cool would that be wow. i would be stood there all night going Play, uh, nobody does it better. Play the Bond thing. Yeah. Play Goldfinger. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't be a good customer for him, I don't think. I'd just no, probably no. be a bit annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bond fact number three, he teaches an adult education cl- course in Chicago called the James Bond Phenomenon. Now, I did all right at school. You know, I got I got some good marks. I got some that were pretty awful. I think if I did a course in James Bond, I think I'd be A-star material, don't you? 
why is this not like standardized course across the UK? I know. I, I mean, I mean, you know. come on. It's like teaching Shakespeare and all that bollocks at school. Yeah. yeah. All right. He's had his time. Let's put Shakespeare yeah. to bed. Let's get something yeah. that's applicable today. Let's get Bond in, school, in schools. Yeah, exactly. Why not? Yeah. We'll start a protest and a you know, Damn right. petition. Yeah. Let's <laughs> write to David Cameron. Get it happening. <laughs> Okay, so it's time to answer our trivia questions of the day. As you went first, let's hear yours again, Chris. Okay, so my trivia question was, um, with the Raymond Benson Bond novels, some of them have been grouped together to form an anthology, and there were two that were made, um, two different groups of books, and I'd like to know the names of those, please. I remember one was called Choice of Weapons. Yes, well done. And the other one, was it just called the Union Trilogy? I'll definitely give that to you without a doubt, yeah, because I think it's referred to as Union Trilogy, but I think it's something like the Union Trilogy, colon, or semicolon, three Bond novels or something like that, which is three 007 novels or something, but obviously... Yeah, I knew there was a subtitle in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah, but I think, obviously, Union Trilogy, Weapons of Choice is good. Yeah, Yeah, I liked it. Wicked. And And over to you. My trivia question of the day is, what is Ian Fleming's middle name? Now, this one... Um, I do actually remember because I, when we did our, um, a bit about, uh, Fleming in one of the podcasts, the, the TV series, I mm. remember bringing it up because I, that, do you remember, I thought that might've been the name of his father at the time, which obviously That's it turned true. out not to be, yeah. but yeah. So, uh, Ian Fleming's middle name, Lancaster. Very good. Excellent stuff. Which, which is quite a cool war, wartime sort of name. It is, isn't it? Know? Yeah. The Lancaster and, and bomber and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 It brings it all there. Yeah, it's I quite like good. It. Good stuff. Okay, so it's okay. quote time, I think, isn't it? Bond, 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 Bond. James Bond. Oh, oh, mate, that was great. I loved it. It was good. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my quote for, uh, from last time, I'm going to just repeat the performance and see if you can get it. <clears throat> okay. It doesn't take a lot of preparation, this one. I don't <laughs> really have to get into character all that much, but I'm, you know, no. I'm going to give it a little shot. Delicious. Like okay, it. do you need to hear it again or are you happy with that? I, th- I, th- I, think, I think one more, one more for the listeners. Okay. Delicious. Okay, now I can think of someone who says this word, mm. but I'm not sure if it's the right person in terms of, of, of the way it's said, but I'm going to go with the person I think anyway. Uh, the person I remember saying that is Elliot Carver in Tomorrow Never Dies. Well done. Correct. Full points. Who else that did you think it was? One. No, no, that's who I thought it was, but I, I wasn't quite sure. Uh, like initially, I thought it was something to do with food, obviously, but nothing was ticking the box. And then I, I remember him tapping away about the, the yeah, war. Yeah, that's it. He's something. got his headlines, doesn't he? That's what he's doing. He's tapping yeah. up his headlines. He's happy with it. Delicious. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> okay, so my quote for this week is an interesting one. Um, I'll see if I can get into car- character. Okay. <clears throat> is he one of ours? Ooh, let's hear it again. Okay. I, I'm not quite getting the voice down. Okay, wait a minute. Here we go. <clears throat> is he one of ours? Dude, you've got me there. That's not ringing any bells I- at all. I, I, it will, it will tweak. It will, it will, it will go. Do you want one more? Yeah, let's have it one more time. Okay, okay, <clears throat> okay. Is he one of ours? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I've got, yeah. Oh. There, there is another line that I can add on to that, but I'll wait. I'll leave that until next time, right, and then yeah. I'll add that line I'll, if needs to. I'll get onto yeah. watching all 20, 20, 23 <laughs> movies <laughs> until I hit on it and then, then I'll know next time. Cool. Okay. Very nice. Okay, Tricky so one, though, before we, uh, we sign off, um, basically what we're going to do moving forward is switch to twice monthly episodes. Um, basically, that was our plan from the outset was to do uh, two a month. Um, and then when we got picked up by iTunes' new and, no- no- new and noteworthy section, we decided to fire out an episode each week for a while. So... Um, so yeah, so we've done you know eleven episodes, and uh, we'll be switching to twice a month from now on. Just so you know, so our next episode will be in two weeks. And what are we going to be talking about? So the next uh, Bond episode, because we recently 
reviewed Thunderball and there is so much that we could have done on that and the mm. history of Thunderball and everything. The next podcast is going to be all about the McClory case and basically ev- all the complications that surrounded Thunderball and everything that happened before and after the film. So there's a lot to go through, but it was interesting, interesting. Absolutely. Like, I mean, there's a ton, like that, that affected the entire series, didn't it? In the sense that it was still up until this year, even when they bought the rights from, to it. From its yeah. Inse- yeah, exactly. From its inception, well, throughout the whole Bond life, it, it's it's had its influence, hasn't it? Yeah. In some way or another. There it is. And I know you've but, uh, you've got your copy of The Battle for Bond, haven't you? Is it The Battle of Bond or The I Battle have, for Bond? Uh, uh, I think it's The Battle of the... No, it's not The Battle of the Bonds. Or is it The Battle of the Bonds? It might be the Battle of the Bonds. The, bat- the Battle of Bonds. I can't remember. One I've got it upstairs. You know I, what we're one of those, about, anyway. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll, 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 so I'll that'll be a little uh, little uh, treasure trove of information there. Yeah. Um, and that'll be that'll be kind of interesting because I know the whole the whole story about how Thunderball came about even was was really interesting. So uh, there's plenty to be talked about there. So I've been Tom Sears. I've been Chris Wright. And we'll see you in two weeks when James Bond Radio returns for the Kevin McClory case. Podcast 0012. See you next time. See you then. Bye. <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> what, is, what is going on? <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>